This is lecture 9.6, which is your introduction to titrations and the calculations that go with them. We're going to start this with titrations between strong acids and strong bases so that the equilibrium piece of it is not present, and you'll kind of get used to the idea of the calculations and the titrations, and then we'll add in the next few lectures how to do this with um, weak acids and equilibrium included. So, if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you stop the video and do the learning targets from chapter 19, section 2, and um, get yourself some background on what it means to see a titration curve and what equivalence is, etc., some of the steps for calculating, um, and the vocabulary. When you're finished, go ahead and restart the video. Okay, so what I want to talk about is um, titration curves first, and I'm only going to show you the curves today for a strong acid, strong base titration, or strong base, strong acid titration. So you're gonna see some characteristics and things that you need to watch for here. Um, later, we'll compare these to titrations of weak acids or bases with strong bases or acids, and those have a different set of characteristics. So what you wanna be looking for here that tells you that this is a strong titration is not really the fact that the pH is so low when it starts, but kind of the fact that the pH is so low when it starts. Um, it would be very difficult to get a weak acid with a pH of one. It would have to be really, really concentrated. Um, so most often, if it were weak, maybe your um, titration might start somewhere up in here for pH. And so since this is um, at a pH of one when it begins, we're fairly certain that we're starting with a strong acid. The next thing that you want to notice is that in the titration curve, um, this middle part here is almost exactly vertical for a really long time, from about 3 to maybe 10 or 11, okay? And really what this is telling you is that a very teeny tiny little small volume of sodium hydroxide was added and the pH changed drastically. As a matter of fact, it's almost straight up and down from just maybe a few drops. So this is a definite characteristic of a titration of something strong with something strong. Because in a strong acid, strong base titration, you're not ever creating a buffer. You either have excess H3O or H plus ions, or you have excess hydroxide ions. And so the pH stays really low for a long time and then gets really high right away and stays high. And so this center line that's almost vertical is a characteristic of that. Um, to find the equivalence point of any titration, you're looking for the vertical spot here and looking for the center. So if this is my vertical spot, about the center would be about there. And you can tell that at the equivalence point, when you have added equal number of moles of your two reactants, the um, the pH will be seven. In this case, that makes sense because for a strong, strong, strong titration, your net ionic equation looks like this, one way, of course, which then gives you water as a product. And so if you have exactly the same amount of H plus and OH minus in solution, these will completely 100% react. They would both be limiting. And the only thing left would be water. So this makes sense that for your strong acid, strong base titration, the equivalence point is at 7. Okay, so um, you should be able to talk about that, that at the equivalence point, this is water, and water is the, the auto-ionization of water into hydronium, and hydroxide is the only thing creating the pH in the flask. So that's the first thing. Compare that, I've got two different graphs here. The one on the left is a strong acid, strong base. In other words, the strong acid was in the flask. It was our analyte, and the strong base was in the burette and it's what we call the titrant. And I know that because the pH started low and ended high. So when I hadn't yet added any of my titrant over here, the pH was low. If it's a strong base, strong acid, it's basically flipped um, on, on like a mirror image axis. And so this is the strong base in the flask as the analyte and the strong acid in the burette as the titrant. Notice that it doesn't really matter. I still have this really straight up and down center point here, which is gonna help me know that this is a strong, strong titration. And the center of this point is pretty much at seven, which is our equivalence point, okay? 
Um, a few things about indicators. If we're doing acid-base indicators, most weak acids or strong acids or strong bases or weak bases are colorless. And so there would be no way for us to know what the pH was in, an, in a lab scenario if we weren't using an acid-base indicator. So this is something that's kind of cool, actually, and I've decided that if I come back in a second life, I want to come back as an indicator because it's kind of like being a chameleon. That what happens is that if you are a weak acid and you have one color, and your conjugate base is a different color, then you are, can be used as an acid-base indicator, okay? So acid-base indicators are simply weak acids whose conjugate bases have different colors. And we use HIN as a generic because that stands for the weak acid of the indicator, and the IN minus then would be the conjugate base form of the indicator, okay? Um, so you have to think Le Chatelier here to decide which color would be present in the presence of base, so this would be, oops, sorry, this would be the presence of OH minus, would be in presence of base, and the OH minus would react with the H3O plus in the equilibrium of this weak acid conjugate base equilibrium of the indicator. So if it reacts with the H3O plus, it pulls it out of solution, and the reaction, according to Le Chatelier, would have to proceed to the right to fill it back in. And when the reaction proceeds to the right, it forms more of the IN minus, so its concentration would go up, and we would see the color that would be the basic color, okay? Um, in the presence of an acid now, we have to picture that this would be in the presence of any acid, which would then, um, the H plus ions could combine with the hydronium in water. Now we have extra of this, and it's a common ion. And since the H3O plus is a common ion, it's going to react to use up the excess of the common ion, which will shift the reaction to the left, which means now the concentration of the HIN will go up. So picture that when this happens, the IN minus goes down, and we're going to see the acidic color. So the cool part about this is, is that if equal quantities of H3O plus and OH minus are present, this pretty much settles out at equilibrium being equal quantities of HIN and IN minus. So when you have equal quantities of your two forms of your indicator, your acid and the conjugate base form of the indicator, then you see a mixture of, it's a pretty much an even concentration mixture of HIN and IN minus, and so you see a mixture of the colors of those two. So you can see, I put this picture on from your book, I really like this because you can see the colors that these indicators would be. And what you notice is that this range for almost all of these is about a range of, a pH range of about two, maybe one and a half to two, right? And so this is because the um, effective range of an indicator is about a ratio of, I think Henderson Hasselbeck now, about a ratio of IN minus to HIN of no more than 10 to 1 or 1 to 10. So because of this, um, we're going to be about a pH range of one either direction from the pKa of that HIN. So if you were using Henderson Hasselbach here, um, pH would be equal to pKa if IN minus and HIN are equal. And so the pKa of the indicator would give you that middle point, right? This would be at the pKa. But if you're about one either direction, then they, they will tell you um, that that's about a 10 to 1 ratio. All right, so we use this a lot in acid-base um, titrations because we need to be able to choose an indicator that's going to be present when our reaction reaches the equivalence point. So when our reaction reaches this point here, whoops, this point here where the two reactants are exactly equal, I need my indicator to change color so that I can stop. If it changes color too soon, like maybe down here, I would stop way before the equivalence. And if it changes color at a pH that's too high, then it's gonna, I'm going to go too far. And so remember that I'm trying to get this to the exact equivalence point. So I need to choose an indicator that will match my equivalence point in order to make my end point, when I actually physically stop titrating, the same point as my equivalence point. Okay, so um, I asked you in your learning targets to kind of write the steps that would be required 
for titrating an acid with a base or a base with an acid as long as they're both strong. So um, what I want you to do is stop the video here and evaluate what you have in your notes. And if you need to, take a few seconds to copy my steps here because this is pretty much the way I'm going to show you to do these, pro these um, problems. And that way you'll have it and you can be referring back and forth to it as you do problems and as I do a problem with you. Okay, so take a second if you need to. Notice that this one is a strong acid as the analyte in the flask, titrated with, which means the strong base is in the burette, and it is our titrant. Okay, um, and so the um, strong acid that's in the flask, the amount is the same the whole way through the titration, but the amount of base that's coming in will keep increasing as we keep adding it. And so this is what you have to think about. So stop the video here if you need to and write these steps. And then when you restart the video, do the same if you feel like you need to for going the other direction. All right, so I'll put this back on screen. You can stop the video here. Welcome back. Let's go here. And if you'd like to write these in the other direction, you can stop the video again. If you feel like you're okay just going backwards and remembering the differences, then you don't really need to rewrite them. So I do want to back up and let's talk through this really quickly. Um, there are several reference points that you need and you pretty much need to know how much volume you would add to get to the equivalence point so that you have a reference when you're doing these problems because what you're going to notice is they ask you for the pH in many different stages in the titration. So you kind of need to know when will I be at equivalence, what will be happening here. So the easiest way to do that is to calculate the volume and or the moles of the titrant needed so that you have a reference point. And then remember that before you begin, you have only the strong acid, in this case, in the flask. And so the molarity of the H plus in the strong acid will find your pH. So you can find it, take the negative log, and be done. Once you start titrating, now it's a BCA problem. And so you need to find the moles of HA, or H plus in your strong acid and the moles of OH minus in your strong base. Set up your net ionic equation in your BCA chart. Use your initial moles in the B line and then fill in the chart and choose the scenario. If you have strong acid left, then you need to divide the moles that are left by the new total volume. So remember that you will have had your original volume in the flask plus the amount added of the um, titrant. So this is important and you'll find the molarity of the hydronium then or the hydrogen ions and that will let you find pH. If neither is left at equivalence, that means you are exactly at the equivalence point and you have only a pH of 7 from the auto ionization of water. That's because this is a strong acid and a strong base. And so remember, you also have the cation and anion in there, like maybe sodium and chloride, but those are neutral. Now that you know about the pH of salts, you know that they can't affect the pH. If your strong acid was your limiting reactant and you've added more base, more of your strong base than you had, now you again need to find your new total volume. So this would be the original plus what you added. And you're going to divide the excess moles of strong base by the total volume to find the molarity of the OH minus. And then you'll have to go from POH to HPH. Okay, so let's do a problem. The, the reverse is similar, just changing um, who the analyte is in the flask and who the titrant is. So we'll practice actually one like this. So I picked a hard one because I really want to make sure that you're good at what you're doing here. And so the first thing that we're going to do is talk about an example that's a little bit different from what I just talked you through. And that would be the idea that this is strontium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And this is hydroiodic acid, which is a strong acid. But your strong base has two hydroxides. And this means that when you're calculating the moles of your base that you care about, you have to make sure that you're talking about OH minus moles, not moles of strontium hydroxide, because there are two moles of hydroxide, so it will take twice as much of your acid to neutralize it. Okay, so that would be our first thing. We're going to write our balanced net ionic equation. And this would just be, remember, the strontium and the iodide are completely soluble here. So this is going to be OH minus for the strontium hydroxide plus H plus for the hydroiodic acid. And that's going to form water. So this would be our net ionic equation. Then we're going to calculate the initial moles of our important ion. And so I'm going to do that down here. 
our important ion is strontium hydroxide. And so I'm going to start, I can do this a couple of different ways. I'm going to start with 25 milliliters of strontium hydroxide solution. And I'm going to convert milliliters to liters. And you can do this in the beginning if you want, just by moving the decimal. And then I'm going to say for every one liter, there are, because of the molarity, 0 0.050 moles of strontium hydroxide. And then I need to go from moles of strontium hydroxide, because I don't care about the compound, I care about the hydroxide, to moles of OH minus. So this would be one mole of the compound has two moles of OH minus. And when I do this, I'm going to find out that that would be 0 0.0025, and technically I have four sig figs, OO moles, oh no, I don't, I have only two sig figs from my molarity, sorry, 0 0.0025 moles of OH minus in my 25 milliliters. So this is how many moles of OH minus are in my flask when I start, okay? I could do this another way. You could do volume times molarity as long as your volume is in liters, but then you have to remember times the number of OH minuses in the formula, in the compound, okay? So this would be the same idea. This would be 0 0.02500 liters. I'm gonna go ahead and just move the decimal times the molarity, 0 0.050 molar. And then there are two OH minuses, okay? And so this is gonna give me the same numbers. Notice I'm doing the same exact math, and you can decide which way you like better. Just make sure that you choose one and stick with it, okay? So now I know how many moles of hydroxide are in my flask when I start. The next thing I wanna do is calculate the volume of the titrant or the HI required to reach the equivalence point. This is to give me a reference. I technically wouldn't have to do this unless they ask me for it, but I always kind of like to know where I am in my titration. I want to know, am I still here? Am I close to here? Am I past here? I just really kind of want to know that. So I always find this as a reference point. So the easiest way to do this, especially when you have a double hydroxide, is to start with your moles of OH minus. So this will be 0 0.0025 moles of OH minus, and I'm going to do stoichiometry. Um, for every mole of OH minus, I need to know how many moles of H plus, this would be for my HI, right, I would need. And so um, I can come back up here and see that my net ionic equation is one to one. So I'm going to put in one to one. And then I didn't ask you about H plus, I asked you about HI. So technically, um, there would be one mole of H plus in every one mole of HI, your acids are always one to one because your only strong acid that has two is, is um, sulfuric, but it's technically only the first hydrogen that's strong. So you'll only, only ever have one that you have to worry about there. But remember, I didn't. what we're trying to solve here for is the volume of the HI solution that we would need to reach equivalence. So I need to go one step further and I need to go from moles of HI to liters of HI. And the molarity of my HI is 0.1 molar hydroiodic acid. So this would be 0.1 in per liter. So now what this tells me is that I need 0.025, um, I think I have three sig figs, liters of HI, okay, um, at the equivalence point. All right, so this is at the equivalence point. This is how many I'd have to add. So if you need to put that into a frame of reference, that's 25.0 milliliters. All right. So now we have a reference. This means that now I can look at what they're asking me and I can see that before I titrate, I'm going to of course be at the beginning. At 20 milliliters, I'm still going to be before my 25. So I'm still before equivalence. At 25 milliliters, now I'm at equivalence because that's how many milliliters I would have to add to get to equivalence. And at 40 milliliters, I'm after equivalence. And so I just like this as a frame of reference. I think that's really helpful, okay? So we're gonna do these calculations and I'll walk you through these one at a time. So in part D, the first calculation is before beginning. So this means I've added no um, hydroiodic acid to my strontium hydroxide, which means that I have 0 0.0025 moles of OH minus, which is sitting in my flask. And it's sitting in um, a volume of, I forgot how many milliliters. Let's go back and look, 25 milliliters. Um, 
so this is 0 0.025 liters of solution in my flask. And this is going to be now, I'm trying to find the concentration of hydroxide so that I can just take its negative log and find pOH, all right? So this is going to end up being um, 0.1 molar, 0 0.10 molar OH minus. The other way that you could do this would be to say I have point, what's my molarity? 050 molar strontium hydroxide. And remember, for every one mole of strontium hydroxide, I have two moles of OH minus, and so that would give me 0 0.10 molar OH minus. So you could do it either way, but you need the molarity of just the OH minus. And then PA, POH, I'm sorry, would equal the negative log of your OH minus concentration, which is 1 times 10 to the negative first, so the POH will be 1, technically with two significant figures. Okay, and then to find pH, I'm going to subtract from 14, and that's going to be 13.00 as my pH after or before I start titrating. All right, so before you begin, come back up here, before you begin, you, oops, where are my rules? You are going to find your initial moles of OH minus, right, um, and kind of remember that before you begin, you are just figuring this out in the molarity and taking the negative log, okay? Um, so let's keep going. In part B, or part two now, they're gonna say I've added 20 milliliters of HI. So in part two here, the first thing that I wanna do is find the, let me come back so you can see it, find the moles of the H plus that I'm adding, okay? So if I'm adding 20 milliliters, that's 0 0.0200 liters of solution. I want to find moles of H plus, right? So this will be that times the volume that I've added, or that is the volume I've added, I'm sorry, times my molarity, which in this case is still 0.1 molar. Sorry, it's a lot of scrolling. Um, HI, which then technically times the number of H plus, but this is going to be one right, because HI has one H plus, and so this is going to give me um, 0 0.002000 moles of H plus that I'm going to add, okay, so now I need to set up my BCA chart, so I need my equation, OH minus plus H plus yields water, um, this is actually going to be a reaction now, because I'm putting together the 0.00250, no, 0025 sig figs, sorry. Um, moles of OH minus, and I'm putting in the point 00200 moles of H plus, and I'm not worried about the water. I can look at these right away and see that this is the limiting reactant, so I'm gonna subtract 0 0.00200 moles, leaving me with none. I'm also gonna subtract the same 0 0.00200 moles from um, the OH minus, leaving me with 0 0.0005 moles of OH minus. And since this is OH minus, I need to now find the new molarity so I can take the negative log and go to pOH and pH. So um, the molarity of the OH minus is going to be 0 0.0005 moles that are left divided by my new volume. So I, add, I started with 0 0.025 liters of the base and I added 20 milliliters or 0 0.020 liters, it's really 0 0.0200 um, liters there, but I still have only one sig fig up here, so it doesn't really matter. So that total together, if you want to total it, is 0.045 liters. And when I divide that out, I get a molarity of 0 0.011111, a whole bunch of ones, of OH minus. So pOH would be the negative log of that number. So pOH is... 1.9542, more numbers, pH will be 14 minus that number, which gives me 12.045 more numbers, but remember I have only one sig fig because of my subtraction here, um, here, right? And so my answer is going to be with to one sig fig, which will be 12.0.
So notice, I'm still really high. I've added 20 milliliters. So this is kind of looking at this graph and going, I've already added 20 milliliters, but the pH is still really, really high up here. And that's because we still have so much excess OH minus. Even though 0 0.005 moles doesn't feel like very much, it's still a lot, okay? All right, so let's look. Part three now is, I'm gonna change colors so you can kind of find this easier. Part three is adding 25 milliliters of HI, which is at equivalence. So technically, um, because I already know it's at equivalence, I don't have to do much math, but I'll show you how I would do it. See, because I figured out my frame of reference that 25 milliliters is at equivalence. When I've added 25 milliliters, I will be there. But I can follow the exact same process and then I don't have to think very hard. So I can say 0 0.02500 liters of 0.1 molar HI, so there's one, um, my number of hydrogens is one. Um, and so this is going to be 0 0.002500, oops, too many zeros, O moles of H plus added, right? So now I can set up OH minus plus H plus yields water in my BCA. I start with the same because I always pretend I started back at the beginning. 0 0.025, 0 0.0025 moles of OH minus, and I've now added 0 0.00250 moles of H plus. I'm not worried about the water. These are exactly the same, so technically they're both limiting. I'm going to subtract 0 0.0025 from each of them, leaving me with none of either, and only water in my flask. So technically you can say the pH is 7 because of... Um, the auto ionization of water. But um, if they ask you to talk about it, then you would have to say uh, my ice chart is going to be 2H2O yields H3O plus plus OH minus, and this I don't care about, and these would be X's, and this would be KW equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14th equals X squared. So the H3O plus is X, which is then 1 times 10 to the negative 7th. So the pH is the negative log of that, which is 7. If you need to show work, if they ask you to show a calculation, this would be the calculation you'd show. If you don't ask for calculation, you can say the pH is 7 because of the auto ionization of water. All right. Finally, the last one. Now you're kind of getting the idea. So the last one, now we're going to be at 40 milliliters of HI added. So I'm going to change colors again so that you can see what's happening. But here at 40 milliliters of HI, I'm expecting I'm after equivalence. So now this should be acidic. So I'm going to do the same thing. Oops, is that four? Um, yep, that would be IV. Sorry. Um, so in IV here, I have 40 milliliters, which is 0 0.0400 liters of 0.1 molar HI which has one H plus. So this is going to be 0 0.00400 moles of H plus. So always figure out your moles first. You have your equation, OH minus plus H plus yields water. We're going to set up our BCA chart. This is the same 0 0.0025 moles that we've been starting with because that was what was in the flask. We've added 0 0.00400 moles of H plus. We don't care about the water. Now you can see that the OH minus is limiting, so I'm going to subtract it and subtract that same amount from both, leaving me with no OH minus and leaving me with an excess of 0 0.0015 moles of H plus. If I want pH, this has to be concentration, so H plus concentration would be those 0 0.0015 moles divided by my new volume. So I started with 0 0.025 liters in the flask and I've added 40 milliliters, so that would be 0 0.0400 liters. This is a total of 0 0.065 liters, right? And I get a molarity of H plus of 0 0.023076 molar H plus, more sig figs than I need, okay? The pH then is going to be the negative log of that number, which is 1.636, a, a bunch of numbers. I have only two significant figures from here, and so my pH is going to be 1.6, 
four. I think that's a 1.636. I hope I did that right. Um, in my scribbles, I can't tell, so I'm going to make it 1.63, 1.64, because I think that this is the correct number. Okay, so this is my um, pH of my solution after I've added past the equivalence point. So notice on the graph at this point now, if I were doing this and this were my graph, I started here and now I'm down here somewhere really low. Okay, so um, so this is how you do these. It's going to take some practice and we'll practice in class and it'll get harder when we add equilibrium and acids and bases that are weak in. But um, you kind of see what's going on there. Okay, so finally, the last question now asks you to tie in an indicator for this titration. So remember that we have to pick our indicator based on our pH at equivalence. But because this is such a long straight line at equivalence, I asked you to choose in the question between um, these three, methyl red, bromothymol blue, or phenolphthalein. So I can come in here to my graph and go methyl red is here and it changes from about four or four point something to about six, right? And bromothymol blue is here and it changes from about six to about mm, 7.5 or eight. And phenolphthalein is here, and it changes from about 8 to about 10, okay? So pretty much of these three indicators, if I look at this graph, I can see, sorry, this graph, I can see that when I start this straight line, my pH is probably somewhere around 10, and I end this straight line, my pH is probably somewhere around 3 or 4, okay? And so when I look at these indicators, I see it, whoops, sorry, going the wrong way. I look at these indicators... I see that really these three indicators between three or four and 10 all fall in there, okay? So pretty much if this were the titration I was doing, I could choose any of the indicators that change between three and 10, which would give me a lot of choices. It won't be the same when we do titrations with weak acids and bases, so you'll have to choose more carefully. But in this one, because I'm looking between the range of here and here on my graph, on my graph, then I have a lot of choices. So technically any of these would be okay. So technically I could use any of these. All right, so there we go. Um, we'll work with this some more in class and um, make sure you bring your notes with you so that, and your calculator.